So, until now we have been dealing with one dimensional potential well problems largely. Now, let us go on to the three dimensional situation. So, <clears throat> we shall now look at a situation where we have potentials and a particle which can move in all three dimensions. So, let us first <coughs> write down the Schrodinger equation in this situation. So, the time independent Schrodinger equation is in this case it is just h the same old equation h psi and now psi is a function of r is equal to e psi and in uh, for a particle which is free to move in three dimensions, the Hamiltonian h is the sum of the momentum squared. So, this is p, it is now a vector quantity p squared by 2 m plus v r. This is the Hamiltonian operator acting on psi which is a function of r is equal to E psi. And the momentum <coughs> we know is equal to this, the operator corresponding to the momentum is minus i h cross times the gradient operator. So, the momentum squared, the momentum has got three components p x y p z and the square of this is minus h cross square into the Laplacian, where if you are not, if you have forgotten what the Laplacian is, in Cartesian coordinate system, the Laplacian is del square is equal to del del x square plus del del y square plus del del z square. Right. So, this is what is the Laplacian in the Cartesian coordinate system. So, this equation, <coughs> the, the time independent Schrodinger equation now becomes minus h cross square by 2 m the Laplacian acting on psi r plus v r psi r is equal to E psi or you can just <coughs> simplify it a little bit so that the differential operator remains on one side and the rest of it is on the other side. So, what that gives us is del square psi r is equal to V r minus E. So, it is ok. So, I have 2 m by h cross square v r minus e acting to psi. Ok. <clears throat> so, this is the equation we are interested in in three dimensions and we want to find solutions to this equation 
in general, there will be solutions for only some certain values of energy, not for all values of energy. And we want to investigate what are the allowed values of energy for different potentials. Now, in general, the potential V of R could be any arbitrary function of the vector R. But the situation is quite simplified if we consider spherically symmetric potentials. So if this potential is spherically symmetric, which is a situation quite commonly encountered. So if you have a spherically symmetric potential, that is vr is only a function of the distance of from some particular point. So if this is the origin of the coordinate system, and if the potential depends only on the distance from the origin, it only depends on this r, and not on the direction, such a potential is called a spherically symmetric potential. So the potential will be identically, will be same on all points on this sphere. And it will be different if I change the radius of the sphere. Such a potential is said to be spherically symmetric. And for a spherically symmetric potential, the problem gets, can be further simplified. So we can proceed for a spherically symmetric potential. We can proceed by using the method of separation of variables. So there it is convenient to use a spherical polar coordinate system, r, theta, and phi. So let me again <coughs> draw this and indicate the coordinates r, theta, and phi. So if this is some point r, then the variable r is the distance to the point. Theta, this is the x-axis. This is the y-axis. This is the z-axis. Theta is the angle it makes with the z-axis. This is theta. And phi is, if you project this r, this vector r, to the xy plane, then the angle this projection makes with the x-axis is phi. OK, so r is the distance of the point from the origin. Theta is the angle it makes with the z-axis. And phi is the angle which the projection of this line, of this line, of the vector, onto the xy plane makes with the x-axis. So instead of using the Cartesian coordinate system x, y, z, it is more convenient, it is convenient in a spherically symmetric situation to use the spherically polar coordinate system r, theta, and phi. The potential v depends only on the distance r. The wave function psi is now a function of r, theta, and phi. And we decompose this into two parts, one capital R, which is a function of only the distance from the origin, and another function y, which is a function of theta and phi. <clears throat> so we are using the method of separation of variables to solve the Schrodinger equation for a particle which is moving, which is in a three-dimensional potential, spherically symmetric potential. And we proceed by using the method of separation of variables. So the wave function we decompose into two parts, shown here. And this we plug in back into the, this we plug back into the equation which we had. So <clears throat> what that gives us is, OK, now we need one more ingredient which is we need to also write down the Laplacian in the spherically polar coordinate system. So the spherical polar coordinate system, so in the spherical polar coordinate system, the Laplacian del square can be worked out. You have to replace the derivatives with respect to x, y, and z with derivatives with respect to r, theta, and phi. We know the relation between x, y, z, and r, theta, phi. So the relation is as follows. Let me also write down the relation between these. So the relation is that, OK, what, so z is equal to r cos theta. z is equal to r cos theta. x is equal to r sin theta cos phi. x is equal to r sin theta cos 
phi and y is equal to r sin theta sin phi. These relations can be easily inverted to obtain r theta and phi in terms of x, y, z also. And then one has to do some algebra and you can replace all the derivatives with respect to x, y, and z which appear in the Laplacian with derivatives with respect to r theta and phi. This is left as an exercise for you to work out and it is given in many, many books in mathematical physics, electromagnetism, quantum mechanics. The form for the Laplacian in terms of spherical coordinate, coordinate system is given in all such books. <clears throat> I'm just going to write down the form over here. So if you write down the Laplacian in the spherical polar coordinate system, what it turns out to be is that the Laplacian is 1 by r del by del r square. Okay, let me put a function here f. So the Laplacian acting on some function f is equal to this acting on so there is the first part is the radial derivative which is 1 by r del by del square by del r square of r into f plus another part which is the angular part which is 1 by r square and then I have 1 by sine theta del del theta <coughs> and here I have sin theta del del theta f plus one more term which is 1 by sin square theta del by del phi square f. So the Laplacian, if you write it in spherical polar coordinate system, is this has these three derivatives, one with respect to r, one with respect to theta, and one with respect to phi. In addition, there are these extra factors of r, sine theta, sine square theta, which appear. Because we are no longer in a Cartesian coordinate system, and the theta and phi directions, r, r and r theta and phi directions, keep on changing from point to point. The x, y, z directions are fixed, but the r theta and phi directions keep on changing from point to point. Because of that, you have these extra terms which appear over here. And this has to be used in the Schrodinger equation. So now let me, okay, so the term in the square bracket, we are going to use the symbol omega to, re to represent this. So this is the operator omega acting on f. So the term in the square bracket, I am going to denote by the operator omega acting on f. So let me write down the Laplacian first again. So the Laplacian acting on f is equal to 1 by r del by del r square r f plus 1 by r square omega f. Now we are going to use this in the Schrodinger equation and we are going to break up the wave function into two parts, one which depends on r and one which depends on theta and phi, the angle. Okay, so with this <coughs> let us go ahead and now do that. So the first term, the Laplacian of psi is now 1 by r del by del r squared into r into capital R into y. Please bear in mind that capital R is a function of only the radial coordinate r. y is a function of theta and phi. Okay, so this is the first part. The second part <coughs> is plus 1 by r squared omega acting on r and y. Here again, omega will only act on y. It will not act on this function of the radial distance r. 
So this is the Laplacian acting on psi. And the Schrodinger is, equation is that this is equal to 2m by h cross squared into v, which is again a function of only the distance r, minus e into r into y. So this is the equation we want to simplify. <clears throat> now in this equation, we can pull y, capital Y, out of this whole thing altogether. So this capital Y can come out. And OK, so let us go ahead step by step and simplify it. So in the first term, the capital Y can come out. So let us write it like that. So we have capital Y over here. And then we have 1 by R del square del r square into r capital R. Let us take this term over here to the left hand side and let us take this term over here to the right hand side. So in this term over here also, okay this term here there is no difference made. So we can write this as minus 2m by h cross square vr minus e into r y is equal to we have take we take this onto the right hand side so this is equal to minus and this r can go out so this is minus capital r by r square the operator omega acting on y <clears throat> so now if we divide this equation throughout by 1, so let us divide the whole equation by this factor over here. So let us divide it by this factor r square r into y. <clears throat> so we are going to divide this whole equation by r square into capital R into y. So if we do that, then what we have obtain is that, okay, so let us divide it. So what we obtain is, let me put it here. So what we are going to divide it is by r, y by r square. We are, no, we are going to divide this by r, y in, by r square. And we are going to divide this by r, y by r square. So the right hand side. Now the r cancels out and the small r square cancels out. And we have this is equal to minus 1 by y omega y. This is the right hand side. The left hand side, let us also simplify that. So the y cancels out over here. And uh, r goes on top. And we have <coughs> r, sorry, this should be over here. So we have r del by del r 1 by capital R and then we have r r minus we have here 2 m r square 2 m r square by h cross square into v r minus e. And the rest of it, r y and r y cancels out. So this is what we are left with. So this is the equation that we are left with. <clears throat> now, if you look at this equation, you will notice that the left hand, left hand side of this equation depends only on the distance from the origin. It has no angular dependence. Whereas the right hand side depends only on the angle. It has no dependence on the distance from the origin. So we have been successful in separating this equation into two equations, into two parts, one which depends only on the distance from the origin, and another one which depends only on the angle. And if these two parts have to be equal, it, is, it follows that these two have to be equal to a constant. Because if I vary r and keep theta phi fixed, this equality, if this equality has to hold, then it has to be equal to a constant. So let us call that constant minus c. So 
the left hand side and the right, have, right hand side have to both be separately equal to a constant and we are going to call that constant minus c. So we now have two different equations. So let me write down these two equations. So the first equation which we have is r by capital R del square by del r square r into capital R minus 2m r square by h cross square vr minus e is equal to <coughs> minus c, which we can simplify a little bit. So let us also do that. So this is now, this what this, so we can take everything over here onto that side. So what that gives us is del by del r square r capital R minus 2m r by h cross square v r minus e into r is equal to minus c into capital R by small r. So this is the radial dependence of the wave function and you have to solve this equation to determine the radial dependence of the wave function. This equation has to be solved to determine the radial dependence of the wave function. The angular dependence of the wave function <coughs> is governed by the following equation. So we have 1 by y omega acting on y is equal to c or omega y is equal to c y. So the angular dependence, <coughs> let me again remind you that r is a function of the distance alone and y is a function of theta and phi. So you have to solve this equation to obtain the radial dependence of the wave function and you have to solve this equation to obtain the angular dependence of the wave function. Now <coughs> there are some very interesting features to note here. The radial equation depends on the potential and for different potentials you will have different solutions. You have to solve it again. But the angular equation does not depend on the potential. So irrespective of the potential, once you have solved the angular equations, these, these solutions hold irrespective of what potentials, what, what potential you use. So we are going to first investigate this particular equation. The second feature to note is that there will be solutions as we have noticed earlier also like for example in the simple harmonic oscillator problem or in the square well potential problem, we have seen that there will be solutions, there will be well behaved solutions for only certain values of this constant c and of so there will be a few set of solutions for certain values of allowed values of c and e and we have to find these solutions. Any arbitrary solution can be expressed, we shall, we shall see that any arbitrary solution can be expressed as a superposition of these solutions. Okay. <clears throat> now these, so we are going to first focus on this, on the angular dependence which does not depend on the potential, nature of the potential as long as it is spherically symmetric. Later on we shall look at particular case of this potential. These functions y, theta, phi are called the spherical harmonic functions. These are what are known as the spherical harmonics. Okay. And they can be obtained by just directly solving this equation, but we shall, this will be a partial differential equation in theta and phi. 
This can be again decomposed by separation of variables into two equations, one a function of theta and one a function of phi. And they, this can be again solved in that by using that method. And the solutions are called the spherical harmonics. Instead of going directly to the solution of this equation, we are going to try and understand the physics a little. We are going to try and interpret this equation and look at the physical content of this equation. So in order to do that, let us <coughs> shift our focus a little bit. So let me now, <coughs> so let us first look at the Schrodinger equation in written in terms of this. So the Schrodinger equation, which written in terms of this operator omega, which we are going to study, is shown here. Okay. So it has got one part, which is a derivative with respect to r acting on the wave function. And then there is this omega acting on the wave function. And it is omega divided by 1 by r squared. And this is equal to 2m h cross by h cross square v minus e into the wave function. So keep this in mind. OK. Now, <clears throat> if you consider a particle moving in a three-dimensional spherically symmetric potential, and you write down the Hamiltonian for this particle in classical mechanics. If you write down the Hamiltonian for this particle in spherical polar coordinate system, instead of the Cartesian coordinate system, if you write down the Hamiltonian in a spherical polar coordinate system, then the Hamiltonian, the same Hamiltonian turns out to be So the same Hamiltonian written in a spherical polar coordinate system using spherical polar coordinates <coughs> turns out to be this. I leave it to you as an exercise to work out the Hamiltonian for a particle moving in a spherically symmetric potential in, to work out the Hamiltonian in spherical pol polar coordinates. Let me explain to you what P r and L r. P r is the, there will be no operator here because it's the classical Hamiltonian right now. So PR is the radial momentum. And this is equal to MR dot, the rate at which the particle is moving away from the center origin. Right. So the same Hamiltonian, which in the Cartesian coordinate system would have been written by 1 by 2M, px square plus py square plus pz square, we are now writing in terms of the radial quantities, the spherical polar coordinate co quantities defined in the spherical polar coordinate system. And the first quantity over here is the radial momentum, which is m r dot. The second quantity l is the angular momentum. So this is a vector, and we know what the angular momentum is. It is m into r cross p. <coughs> so classically, this is the angular momentum. And the Hamiltonian can also be written in this form. It is just the radial. So this is the kinetic energy corresponding to the ra radial motion, you may say. And this is the kinetic energy corresponding to any circular motion. The circular motion. The radial motion doesn't contribute to the angular momentum. So this is the kinetic energy corresponding to the circular motion. This is the kinetic energy corresponding to the radial motion. And the potential is still there. Okay. So the, the Hamiltonian can also be written in this fashion. And L square is just the square of the angular momentum. Now, <coughs> if you look at this expression, so the sh corresponding Schrodinger equation now will be this, you have to convert this into an operator. You have to convert this into an operator. 
and it will be this operator acting on psi is equal to E psi. So it will, the Schrodinger equation remains the same. <coughs> now if you compare the Schrodinger equation, which we just wrote down here, with the same Schrodinger equation where we had started from a Cartesian coordinate system and then converted into a spherical polar coordinate system, you will realize that this term over here, L square by R square, <coughs> is possibly the term which corresponds to this. So if you look at this equation here, this you may try to, you may say that this corresponds to this PR, the radial momentum, and this is this term over here, V is there and E is there. So this Schrodinger equation which we had just written down, the same Schrodinger equation, if you look at it now, you can identify the operator omega with the square of the angular momentum. So let us now look at the angle, so there is some motivation to try and identify the operator omega with the square of the angular momentum. So let us now investigate the properties of the angular momentum operator in quantum mechanics. So we are now interested in the angular part of the Schrodinger equation and we see that the angular part of the Schrodinger equation is the operate is, has to be obtained, the angular part of the wave function has to be obtained by solving the equation omega psi is, omega y is equal to some constant into y and the operator omega we see that it is related to this angular momentum squared. So let us now investigate the properties of angular momentum in quantum mechanics and see how it is related to the <coughs> solution to that operator omega. <coughs> so classically we know that the angular momentum is r cross p and we have the three components. So let me write down the three components and then we can write down the operators corresponding to this, these. So the three components are Lx and Lx will be y into <coughs> Pz minus Z into Py. Sorry, there should not be a M over here. The M is in the P already. <coughs> it is M into R cross V or R cross P. Then Ly. So once we know this, we can easily write down what is Ly by doing a circular permutation, cyclic permutation. Cyclic permutation means that if you have x, y, z, you keep on rotating them in a cyclic fashion. So you replace z everywhere with y. So you, we have replaced x, so it is in the opposite direction now. We have replaced x with y. So we have to replace y with z and z with x. This is how we do a cyclic permutation. So let us do it. So we have replaced x with y. We have to replace y with z. So we have z and then we have px minus z has to be replaced by x, x, p, z. <coughs> and we have lz is equal to, so we have to now, to obtain z, we have to replace z with x, every x has to be replaced with y, so every x has to be, no sorry, x has been replaced by with z, so z has to be replaced by y and y with x, so this will be x and I have py minus <coughs> y px. Okay, so these are the classical components of the classical angular momentum. Now when we convert them into operators, we have to just replace these with the corresponding operators. So let us also write those down. So the <coughs> operator Lx this is equal to, there will be a minus i h cross outside and then I have y 
del del z minus z del del y and l y is equal to minus i h cross and then I have z del del x minus x del del z and I have l z which is equal to minus i h cross <coughs> and I have x del del y minus y del del x. So, these are the three operators corresponding to the three components of angular momentum in, in quantum mechanics. Now, let me ask you the question, are these three operators Hermitian or not? Well, if you look at them, it is quite obvious that these three operators are, are all Hermitian because, okay, it's, they commute these two operators, the operators y and pz, if you look at this expression over here, lx is equal to y pz and z minus z py. Now, y pz, the Hermitian conjugate of lx, the, com the conjugate of lx will be the conjugate of pz into y and the conjugate of py into z. Now, these are each Hermitian and they commute. If two operators are Hermitian and they commute, then their product is also Hermitian. This is something which is quite clear from the definition and the way you of the of a operator being Hermitian and the behavior of a product of two operators when you take the conjugate. So, these are the three operators corresponding to the three components of angular momentum. Let us also work out some very important properties of these three operators. Let us work out the commutation relation between these three operators. This is where angular momentum differs drastically from the linear momentum. Linear momentum we have seen that the three operators Px, Py, Pz, they commute with each other. The commutator of Px with Py this is 0. Similarly, p y and p z commute with each other. It is only x and p x which do not commute. Similarly, y and p y do not commute and z and p z do not commute. So, x p x this is equal to i h cross. Right. Similarly, y p y is equal to i h cross, z p z is equal to i h cross, but x y z and p x p y p z they all commute amongst themselves. So, the coordinates commute amongst themselves, the operate, the momentum commute amongst themselves. But the three angular momentum operators, they do not commute amongst themselves. So, let us work out the commutation between these three operators. <coughs> so, let us work it out over here. So, we want to wor work out, for example, Lx. comma l y. So, let me work, let us work this out. <coughs> in, okay. So, this is equal to, let us first write down what is l x. So, l x is equal to y p z minus z p y, y p z minus z p y. The commutator of this with l y, l y is z p x minus x p z. So, let us, this will give us four terms. Let us first write down these four terms. This is equal to the first term will be the commutator of y p z with z p x
the second term will be minus <coughs> the commutator of z p y with z p x. The third term will be plus no, rather minus y p z with x p z and the fourth term will be plus z p y with x p z. So, we have to evaluate these four commutators. So, let us go ahead and evaluate them one by one. So, let us look at the first commutator which we have to evaluate. So, the first commutator has got y p z, the commutator of y p z with z p x. Now, y commutes with everything that is there. y commutes with p z, y commutes with z, y commutes with p x. So, there is no reason why we cannot pull this y outside the commutator because it commutes with everything, we know that. So, we can take the y outside. Similarly, p x commutes with everything. The only things which do not commute with each other which need to remain inside is r, p z and z. So, we can take the p x out and what remains inside is the commutator of p z with z. <coughs> so, this is the first commutator. The second commutator is minus. So, now let us see what can be pulled out. So, z is there over here and z is there over here. We have p y and we have p x. So, the left hand side and the right hand side, the, the two terms in the inside this commute with each other. So, this commutator is 0 because everything here commutes with each other. x z commutes with z, z commutes with p x and p x and p y commute, p y and z commute. So, this term is 0. Everything inside here commutes. Let us look at the third term. The third term will give us a y can be taken outside and the <coughs> what else can be taken outside? There should be a p x over here. Uh, it is ok. So, y let us check the third term once. So, the third term comes from z p y. No, the third term comes from y p z commutator with z p x. So, let us see y commutes with x, y commutes with p z, p z commutes with p z. So, the third term is also 0. Everything here commutes with each other. Let us look at the fourth term. The fourth term has got z p y and x p z. Again, we can pull out the p x and p y and x outside. So, we have plus p y and we have x and we have a commutator of z p z. <coughs> the commutator of z p z we know is i h cross and this will be minus i h cross. So, what we are left with is i h cross. So, let us write this term first. So, what we have is x p y minus y p x. <coughs> now, let me show you the three angular momentum where it will be obvious what this actually corresponds to. So, we see that x p y minus y p x x p y minus y p x corresponds to L z. So, this is equal to nothing but i h cross L z. So, we have worked out one of the commutators over here. I will not explicitly work out all three of the commutators over here. Let me just give you the final result and I leave it to you as an exercise to work out the three, the, commut the all possible commutators that is L x, L y, 
Ly Lz and Lz Lx. The final result can be summarized as follows. The commutator Li Lj is equal to I h cross epsilon i j k l k. <clears throat> Let me explain this relation to you. i, j and k are indices which run from 1, 2 and 3. So, i, j, k can take values 1, 2 and 3. 1 corresponds to x. So, i, j, k can be 1, Two or three, any of these. Okay. One corresponds to x. Two corresponds to y. Three corresponds to z. So L one, L two is the commutator of when i is equal to one and j is equal to two. This is the commutator of L x with L y. <coughs> now let me explain to you what. So this left hand side is clear. What is the right hand side? The right hand side has got two terms, one is epsilon i j k, other is l k. Now, whenever two indices are repeated, you are supposed to sum over all possible values. So, you are supposed to sum over all possible values means you are supposed to sum over 1, 2 and 3. So, k has to be summed over 1, 2 and 3. This is what the repeated indices indicate. This is what is known as the Einstein summation convention. So, <coughs> For example, A, K, B, K, this will indicate A1, B1 plus A2, B2 plus A3, B3, which is nothing but Ax, Bx plus Ay, By plus Az, Bz, which is nothing but A dot B. So this is a different way of writing A dot B. It is a very convenient notation in certain contexts and this is what is called the Einstein summation convention. Any two indices, any index which is repeated, if it appears twice, you are supposed to sum over it, sum, sum over it. So here k appears twice. So you are supposed to sum over all possible values. The epsilon ijk is called the Levi Civita symbol. It is something which is totally anti-symmetric in the three indices. And it has got the property that <coughs> epsilon 1, 2, 3 is equal to 1. And it is anti-symmetric. What that means is that if I interchange any two of the indices, I will pick up a minus sign. So epsilon 1, 3, 2 is equal to minus epsilon 1, 2, 3, which is equal to minus 1. <coughs> From here, it also follows that epsilon 1, let us say 1, 2, 2 is equal to minus epsilon 1, 2, 2. Because if I interchange the 2, 2 with 2, I, I should pick up a minus sign, which tells us that this has to be equal to 0, because a quantity which is its own negative is 0. So if any of the three indices are repeated, it is 0. And the only non-zero ones are, one, are permutations of 1, 2, and 3. Okay, so the result of this commutation relation can be summarized as follows. And if you put 1 here and 2 here, then you will get this is equal to L1, L2 is equal to I. H. You should distinguish the I over here from the I over here. Okay, it should not sum over uh, I which appears like this. It should be an index for some operator or variable. And if you sum over this, so here I have epsilon 1, 2, k, l, k. Right. This is, if I put 1 here and 2 here, then what I get is l1, l2 is equal to i h cross epsilon 1, 2. I still have the k here and k here. k has to be summed over all possible values. But if k is 1, then this epsilon is 0. Because if any two indices repeat, it is 0. If k is 2, again the epsilon is 0. The only non-zero value is when k is equal to 3. So this gives me i h cross l 3. 
Okay. Similarly, if you put in 2, 3 over here, then you will find that the only non-zero value is L1. And if you put in 1, 3, it is L2. And whether it is a plus sign or minus sign is fixed by how many permutations you have to do from epsilon 1 to 3 to obtain this particular epsilon. Okay. So I will stop here for today. In tomorrow's class, we shall continue with the properties of the angular momentum operator and how it is related to the Schrodinger equation in for a three-dimensional potential. <coughs>